Welcome to the lecture on distributed minimum spanning trees and distributed snapshots. So what we had seen in the earlier lecture on leader election that if we are able to somehow overlay a tree on top of a network on top of distributed nodes if we can somehow overlay a tree instead of a ring which we have been traditionally used to be doing. So then what we can do is many distributed algorithms become simpler. For example, electing a leader, finding the smallest element, you know, minimum finding, all of that becomes much easier. So in this lecture as well, we will discuss one way of taking a snapshot of a network that also becomes easier if we have a tree. So which tree should we choose? Well, a good tree is a minimum spanning tree. The reason being, it minimizes the length of the edges, so it kind of keeps things close by. So we will discuss the gallagher hamlet spira algorithm, the GHS algorithm. We will discuss the overview, the algorithm and, and the analysis. And then everything about distributed snapshots. So let's first look at some basic properties of an MST. So it is important that before uh, the MST is understood, the following algorithms, the Kruskal's algorithm and the Prim's algorithm, both of these are understood quite thoroughly including the proofs. It is very important to go through both of these algorithms. The Prim's algorithm and the Kruskal's algorithm for sequential MST finding and uh, the proof of the Prim's algorithm particularly is very important. So the inductive proof of the Prim's algorithm, you should go through it. All right. So uh, then I'll. So now I will suggest a few. Well, uh, so I've already suggested algorithms, but you can look at it from a popular text on algorithms first, and the proofs are important. So now, without proving, without going into the depth, I will list a few properties of an MST that we shall use. The first is the property of uniqueness, which says that if each edge of the graph has a unique weight, then the MST is unique. All right. So this goes without saying. This is easy to prove. So the so this this is our first point that if each edge of the graph is unique, then the MST on a whole is unique. Okay. So you, you will not have two MSTs. Of course, if you have weights with uh, Sorry, if you have edges with same weights, then you could have a non-unique MST, in the sense two MSTs with the same weight. Otherwise, it will not happen. Furthermore, here is one more theorem that is a direct outcrop of the proof of the Prim's algorithm, which says that uh, so it's called construction based on the least weight edge. So let's consider a fragment as a subtree of MST. So if we take a minimum spanning tree. So let's say that this is the tree, right? So let us take a subtree of the minimum spanning tree and let's call this a fragment. Okay. So let's refer to this as a fragment. So then an outgoing edge of a fragment has one endpoint in the fragment and one node outside the fragment. As you can see over here, this is the outgoing edge. So this has one node within the fragment and one node outside the fragment. All right. So we basically have a subtree. Then we have the rest of the tree over here, and there is one edge that connects this fragment with the rest of the tree. And uh, so basically, we now are looking at some property of this edge. So for anybody who knows the proof of the Prim's algorithm, this theorem will be rather obvious. That if f is a fragment and e is the least weight outgoing edge, then f union e is also a fragment. What does this mean? That f is a fragment and this is the edge e. So if I let's say if I consider this to be the fragment and this to be to be the rest of the world, and then I draw a line over here, so there might be multiple edges that go from an edge of the fragment to the rest of the tree. So this could be one edge, this could be one more, this could be one more. So let them be E, 
e dash and e double dash. So what the theorem is saying, just look at it. If e is the least weight outgoing edge, which means that out of all the edges that connect this fragment to the rest of the tree, if e is the one which has the least weight, then the claim is that f union e, which basically means that I will I can create a new fragment like this, and this will also be a fragment of the MST in the sense that E will be an edge which is a part of the MST that makes F union E also a fragment of the tree. So this of course is easy to prove. So let us look at this once again. So let's say that this is a subtree, this is a fragment and you have one edge E to the outside, to the rest of the nodes. All right. And so then currently it's a tree, we claim that this is the MST. Let's assume this is not the case. Well, if this is not the case, then what would happen? Then it would mean that there is some other edge E dash, which is a part of the MST and E is not a part of it. Well, but what you would see is that if let's say now I add E dash, this will cre clearly create a cycle. In this cycle, we know that the weight of E dash is greater than the weight of E, right? And let's say within this, if let's say I remove E, we are claiming that this is the MST, but I claim that there is a contradiction. The reason is that, that if I add edge E, okay, so, so let's assume that the rest of the tree remains the same and its weight is fixed. So then if I add wedge, uh, if I add edge E, so, so let, well, let's maybe uh, say that the weight of the fragment is WF and the weight of the rest is WR. So let us consider two trees, one that has E and one that has E dash. So the tree that has E, its weight is WF plus the weight of E plus the weight of the rest of the components, the rest of the tree. And the tree that has E dash, its weight will be again the weight of the fragment plus its own weight because at that point edge E will not be there plus the weight of the rest of the tree. So clearly these parts are common and we claim that this is the MST but this cannot be the case because for this to happen W E dash has to be less than the weight of E which we clearly know is not correct because W E dash is greater than right and so we clearly know that this is not correct hence any out of all the outgoing edges the least weight outgoing edge, which is edge E in this case, has to be a part of the MST and F union E will thus become a fragment. So this is exactly the intuition that is used in the Prim's algorithm to iteratively or I, I should say recursively increase the size of the tree. So what we do is we, we first consider the starting node as a single node, then we look at all of its neighbors, pick the least weight edge. So this becomes a new fragment, then again we draw another boundary around it, then we pick the least weight edge, again we draw another boundary around it, again we pick the least weight edge, maybe this is the one. So we gradually keep on expanding the boundary and we keep on adding edges, but our criterion always is that for the boundary around the fragment that we have created, we just pick the least weight edges and we just keep on adding them. And given the fact that we have proved this theorem now that F union E, maybe I'll write it in a slightly better form, F union E is a fragment, right? We are always sure that the edge that we are adding is a part of the MST. So if we continue to grow the tree, ultimately we will encompass all the nodes and any n node tree will have n minus 1 edges. So when we have n minus edges, we will know we are done. And the proof is by induction. Given the fact that at every step we start from an MST for that fragment and adding a new edge still maintains the MST property, we can prove that when we reach the end, which is when we cover all the n vertices with n minus 1 edges, the tree continues to remain an MST. Of course, if you are not able to understand what I said, then I would suggest that you don't go forward because you will not be able to understand the rest, you first take a look, look at the proof of the Prim's algorithm.
okay that's the most important see first take a look at the proof and then you try to understand this theorem over here if this theorem is understood then then only you proceed otherwise you don't so the overview of ghs is like this that you want to take prims algorithm and create a distributed version of it so initially each node is a fragment so initially every single node is a fragment gradually what happens is nodes fuse together to make larger and larger and larger fragments something that we also saw in ring based leader election where the windows kind of grow larger 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 and larger so in this case the fragments fuse together to make larger and larger fragments and a fragment of course joins another fragment via the previous theorem which is this theorem which is by identifying the least weight outgoing edge furthermore how to find the least weight outgoing edge well all the nodes within a fragment run a distributed algorithm to find the least weight outgoing edge gradually what happens is that the number of fragments this number itself decreases ultimately only one fragment remains which covers the entire set of nodes and of course in this case we are assuming that the graph is connected right and in this and then that is the mst all right so one assumption we make is that of course we have unique edge weights that gives us a unique mst that is one and the other is that the graph is connected okay so these are the two assumptions but this assumption is made by other algorithms as well nothing special over here so what are the properties of a fragment okay so now we are getting into our distributed algorithm not completely but we are kind of looking at it from the outside so let us say let us give each fragment a unique name a unique id so when two fragments combine then all the nodes in one fragment will change their name to a new name all right so what you see is that if two fragments are combining to create a bigger fragment then of course a new name has to be assigned the same way the two companies merge right so what happens is that typically if a large company gobbles up a small company then no name is changed but if two equal size companies kind of merge then the name kind of reflects both we will see something similar happening with fragments that assume that fragment f1 is combining with fragment f2 we will say it can only do so if level of f1 is less than equal to level of f2 what this means is that if one fragment f1 is joining fragment f2 it can only do that if f1 is the smaller guy is smaller or is equal okay but a, so which mean basically means a bigger fragment cannot gobble up a smaller one but a smaller one can always approach a bigger one or one of same size asking it to join fine fair enough if level of f1 is less than level of f2 so level is somehow indicative of its size we will see how if level of f1 is less than level of f2 then all the nodes in f1 take on the name and level of f2 so which basically means if a smaller company joins a big company like a multinational then all the nodes in the smaller company f1 will take on both the name and the level so every fragment has a name and a level and the level is somewhat indicative of its size so if a smaller if level f1 is less than that then f1 loses its identity so then the nodes of f1 will take on the names and levels of nodes in f2 if however if however there's an important point to keep in mind if however level f1 is equal to level f2 then the level of both the fragments gets incremented by 1 so this is important that if two fragments with an equal level are merging then what happens is that the level of the combined fragment increases by 1 gets incremented by 1 that's how the level increases furthermore we will see what happens to the name so that is also interesting they get a new name 
and the new name is basically something that kind of combines the names of both so we will see in a, in a couple of slides how that happens but pretty much if the levels are equal it's more complicated than when the levels are not equal the nodes of f1 union f2 get assigned to a higher level which is the old level plus plus all right so what we are saying is that look we have a small fragment we have a big one and <coughs> we are combining them the combining edge is ef so if let's say f1 is less than f2 in terms of levels then of course the name and level of f2 gets transferred over here but if they have the same level then the level for both is incremented and a new name is given to both such that it becomes one big homogeneous fragment all right so we will now define two important combining rules and one waiting rule so let f1 l1 f1 is fragment f1 with level l1 be desirous of combining with f2 l2 for e f1 is the least weight outgoing edge of f1 and it terminates in f2 so between f1 and f2 e f1 is the least weight outgoing edge from f1 so in consonance with what we have said there are two combining rules one is a less than rule lt rule if l1 is less than n2 then we combine the fragments all the nodes in the new fragment will have name f2 and level f2 it's like the smaller guy merging with the bigger one which we have discussed in this slide as well all right if l1 is less than n2 that's what we do that nodes in the new fragment will have the name f2 and the level l2 but if they are equal that's where we said that we'll that there is a catch if the levels are equal then we check if their least weight outgoing edges are the same or not okay so this is the catch over here so in this case we will combine when we have the same levels subject to the fact that our outgoing edges are the same if they are not we will not so the two fragments combine with all the nodes subject to this so then it's important even if their levels are equal they just don't combine like that only if the lt rule if the levels are not equal then only l1 will combine with l2 otherwise we will see that their outgoing edges have to be the same least weight outgoing edges only then we combine and then as we have discussed the final level is l1 plus 1 and we also discussed that we'll give both the nodes we'll give both the fragments and the nodes within them a new common name and the new common name is basically the name of the edge so let's assume that every edge has a unique weight and unique name also and the name could be just a combination of the two node ids of the edge of the edge right so it's so it could be that doesn't matter howsoever the name is derived but we will essentially the edge will be the common name for the nodes of both the fragments f1 union f2 okay and if any of these above rules don't apply we just wait right we wait for them to apply so this is basically telling us that what we are doing is that small fragments will always go and merge with bigger ones but equal size fragments will have a key condition which is that their least weight outgoing edges need to be the same only then they will actually merge so they will increment their level and a new name will be equal to the edge that connects them the least weight outgoing edge so now we will discuss our algorithm it's a fairly long algorithm so we will have to discuss the state that we maintain so we have three states sleep find and found sleep means the node has not been initialized find means the node is currently helping its fragment search for ef ef is a least weight outgoing edge found means ef has been found or the least weight outgoing edge has been found so so that is what this means all right so here also i am p and uh, the other node is q 
So every node maintains an array called status queue. So status queue is basically the status of the edge from P to Q. So status queue, where I am P and other nodes are Q. So every for every Q, which is my neighbor, I'll have a status queue, status array with a Qth entry. So then it will have three values, basic, branch and reject. Basic means that the edge is unused. Branch means the edge is a part of the MST. Reject means the edge is definitely not a part of the MST. Basic, branch and reject. Basic means as of now we don't know its status. Branch means we know its status and we know it's a part of the MST. Reject means we know its status and we know for sure that it's not a part of the MST. Then we have discussed name and level, right? Name of the fragment, level of the fragment. Parent. So the parent basically says the following that let us say two nodes with the same level combine. Or let's say even a smaller node combines uh, with a bigger node. So there will always be a combining edge. So let us consider it first combination with the LT rule. So let's say that uh, you know this is a small fragment and this is a much bigger fragment. So in this case, right, if this is this is a much bigger fragment, every node over here will basically point to some other node which points to some other node, which will ultimately take it towards the combining edge. So every node will point towards the combining edge. So these are essentially parent pointers which take us towards what is called the combining edge. And similarly, if we have a combination of two fragments where the level was the same, so every node here will also have parent pointers towards this combining edge, the common combining edge. And every node here also will have a parent pointer that goes towards the common combining edge. So we will see why this is the case. But this is how the parent pointers actually work. And then of course we have a bunch of temporary variables like best weight, best node, test node and so on, which are purely, you know, temporary variables. All right, so now let us discuss the algorithms. So the algorithm, the first, so we'll have, we have many algorithms, eight or nine. So always the assumption is that the current node is P and the neighbor is Q. So let us look at the initialization. So let's say that initialization is when things are starting. So let's say that I am node P. And from node P, PQ is the least weight branch. Fair enough. So clearly, you know, if this is the initiator, I can draw a circle around it. PQ intersects this circle. And this needless to say, is the least weight edge. So I set the status of this edge as a branch, status queue as branch. I start from level 0 and my state is found. I found the least weight edge. Rec 0 means, we will see what rec means, but at the moment for this case it is 0. And I send a connect message to Q. So the P will send a connect message to Q. Okay. And so this is when I'm initializing. So this is when I'm starting. I know that the level of Q will uh, at least be my level or, or we will see essentially as far as it is a least weight edge. Let me send a connect message and let's see what Q does. If Q responds, I connect, otherwise I don't. So what I send is I send a connect zero message. We'll see in a second what the zero stands for. But essentially, as far as I am concerned, if Q is my least weight edge, I request to request Q to kindly connect with me. And I do that by sending a connect message. All right. And you can clearly see that in this case, PQ will be a branch, right? Will be a branch of the MST. So there is no reason why it should not be. Now coming to algorithm two, which is the processing of the connect message. So when I receive the connect message, the message type is connect and L is the level of the sender. So in this case, the level of the sender is 0. So when a node receives a connect message, of course, you can say P sent it to Q, but what is our convention? 
our convention is that i am always not p and the other node is q so as far as i am concerned i am not p i am getting a connect message from another node which is q so this is the convention that we adopt might be confusing but this is what we do so now what i do is that look i have gotten a connect message so i will look at my level and the level of the connector so if l is less than level which means that the level that is coming along with the message if that is less than my level no problem this means that a smaller fragment wants to combine with a larger fragment so i can happily combine with the rule lt so absolutely no issues so i'll set the status q to branch right and then i will send an initiate message to the smaller fragment this is a large fragment i'll send an initiate mes message to the smaller fragment saying that look i have accepted your connect message you as of now you are initiated this is your new level this is your new name this is your new state and the state is whatever is my state so if currently i am searching for my least weight edge now you are a fragment and you join me so you need to help me right so whatever is my state that is currently your state so you take it and you initialize yourself no problem so this is sent to q so just a quick disclaimer before this point this p and q business can be confusing because you will you will argue that look in the previous slide p sent a connect message to q now you are saying that i am p and i received a connect message from q how is this possible well in a distributed algorithm we are looking at distributed state machines where every node is an independent computing entity okay this is a node it gets a message based on that it updates its state tables and then it sends messages to other nodes including the one that sent the message to it so that's the reason when distributed algorithms are written this might sound tricky and confusing but i am always node p whoever is doing the action and whoever is sending or receiving a message the entire world outside is always node q so this of course is complicated but if you can appreciate this complexity then appreciating such algorithms will become much much easier so let us come back to our discussion i'll clean the slide so the idea here was that i'm combining with rule lt primarily because here i have a case where i have a small fragment that is requesting a bigger fragment to connect and the bigger fragment has no issues at all so it sets status q to branch and sends an initiate message back to the smaller fragment saying that okay look this is my name level and state henceforth this is your name level and state as well else else if else if this, if this condition is not holding and the status of the node is basic so we will see so the status of the node basically has not been as far as i have con uh, as far as i am concerned this node has not been explored so the status is basic right uh, so then what i will do is i'll combine with rule eq so why will rule eq be useful over here and why not you know so we are automatically saying that if the status of the node is basic does this all automatically mean mean that l is greater than level right and 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 does the do the conditions for rule eq actually hold well so you will see that they actually hold and uh, uh, so so you will see that they actually hold and uh, you know there is no error over here but it is important uh, to remember this we, we 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 might come back to this point so what we do is that we combine with rule eq so for this we send the initiate message right so why eq will come here is at the moment a leap of faith but we'll break that so we send the initiate message so we are saying that they are at the same level 
So, well, no problem. So, your, your new level is level plus one. And your new name, your new, new name is the edge via which this message is coming, the joining edge, which is PQ. Right? So, P on one side and Q on the other side. And that this is how we are joining. And so, the name of the edge is PQ. And furthermore, given that we have joined, our new state should be equal to fine. Fine basically because now we have become a bigger fragment. So, we further need to expand our fragment which means that we need to find our least weight outgoing edge and grow. So, your state is fine as well as you know, my state also has to become fine. So, this is basically what we do that we send an initiate message to the new fragment and the new fragment starts the process of finding. Alright, so we did make certain assumptions here we have not proven but let us continue. So, the application of rule LT and rule EQ would be very clear over here. If you want, you can just go back to this slide where we defined the EQ and LT rules. And as you can see, it was not all that complicated. So, here we basically LT was a smaller fragment with a larger fragment and EQ was both the fragments of the same size and they have the same least weight outgoing it. So, the question that we have kept open is why will the rule EQ be useful over here which we will gradually see why. Now, how do you process the initiate message? So, let us say that again node P, it's always node P gets an initiate message from node K, node Q I am sorry. So, we, the message type is initiate, we get a level dash, name dash and state dash. So, we set the state no problem, we set our we set our level name and state to level dash, name dash and state dash. So, my level is now level dash, my name is name dash and state is state dash. Furthermore, given the fact that this is the combining edge, I set my parent equal to Q. Okay. So, if this is PQ, I set my parent equal to Q. Then what I do is I propagate the update. So, I define a few local variables best node, best weight and test node. We will see what these are. So, for each of my neighbors, for each R element of neighbor P, so basically for each of my neighbors, as long as the status is equal to the is equal to branch. So, essentially I propagate this along the small MST that I have created. Alright. So, along the small little MST within my fragment, I forward this message, which means that the status has to be branch. This means that it is part of this MST fragment. And furthermore, R is not equal to Q, which means that I do not send a message back to my parent. I only send it to my children. So, this indicates that I am only sending the message to my children. And I am sending the initiate message, which means that look, now your fragment has combined with some other fragment. So, now we are the under the rule of a new fragment or let us say we all have changed our name and level. So, I have already done that, now you do it. So, that is the reason we just send an initiate message with a new level name and state to let us say a child R. No problem, the child R also does the same thing, so on and so forth. So, what you can clearly see is that all of them ultimately end up pointing Indirectly, of course, towards the combining edge. Indirectly means via parents. No problem. Now, what we do is, we see what is the state. If the state is equal to find, then it means that I am supposed to play my job as a good member of a fragment by finding the least weight outgoing edge. So, I set the rec variable to 0 again an internal state variable and I call the function find min such that we all members of the new fragment can find the least weight outgoing edge. No problem find min. Find min is not hard at all. So, my find min by the way is not a message as you can see. It is an internal function. So, the internal function is being called over here find min find min this is what it says. So, again I am p the other node is q. As long as there is some node q 
which is an element of neighbor p which means as i look at all the neighbors of p as long as there is some q which is a neighbor such as such that status q is equal to basic which means that this as far as p is concerned is an unexplored edge and out of all of its outgoing edges right so out of all of its outgoing edges that are basic wpq is minimal which means that out of all of its candidate outgoing edges so clearly if the status of an edge is branch or reject it cannot be a candidate outgoing edge right it can only be a candidate outgoing edge if its status is basic which means it is unexplored so if it is unexplored out of all of them i find the node q such that pq out of this set is minimal no problem then i say that q is a test node so then i try to check if it is possible to add q to my fragment all right and kind of grow q i mean grow the fragment via this pq edge so what has happened so what has happened is that look two fragments are merged there has been a common merging edge then initiate messages have been sent so now let's say every node in at least the new fragment is aware that its boss has changed if let's say the boss was in the fine state then all the nodes in the joint fragment will also be in the fine state so boss means the larger fragment if both the fragments are the same level then what we will see you know in a few future algorithms this is algorithm 4 in like algorithm 6 7 8 9 is that if they are the same level they will both of them will actually send initiate messages to each other and then they will increment the levels in both the fragments and then they will also shift to the find state which means that they will start to find the least weight outgoing edge so every node will try to do its part so every node what it will do is it will scan all of its basic edges neighbors whose status is basic find the minimum one and try to see if a connection can be initiated with it so it will it will do a test so it will send a test message indicating its level and its name so name of course is the name of the fragment right not its name the name of the fragment that it belongs to to test node test node in this case is q if of course such a q is not found then it will send test node to null and report this fact that look i didn't find any all right so now there are two possible outcomes of find min one is that you send a test message the other is that you report that look i didn't find anything so let us see what happens to both so how did we reach here the big picture is that look after fragments merged you cannot stop the merge process of merging right so if you, you can't stop the process of a fragment growing so after you have merged two fragments it is a job of every single node in the merged fragment to look for further expansion that is where we enter the find state in the find state every node needs to do its part which means find all of its neighbors with a basic status find the minimal weight neighbor in this set and see if a connection with it can be initiated by sending a test message if it doesn't find of course it should report fine so receiving a test message again same convention i am node p i receive a test message from node q So this PQ stuff can be quite confusing. In fact, the first time that I read it, I thought it was it was pretty challenging. But that said and done, now I've gotten used to it. You also will be. So this is basically that I am getting a test message. I am P from Q and level dash and name dash is Q's name and level. So if Q's level is greater than my level. then by the eq and lt rules anyway it can't combine with it so we just wait i i just keep the message in an internal buffer and i don't do anything i just sleep on it else if name is equal to name dash which means my name and q's name is the same which basically means that a message has been sent to another node of the same fragment well 
then if the status is basic what i do is i mark the status to be reject so, so this clearly cannot be an mst because you cannot have an edge to a node in the same fragment that's not allowed so that will create a cycle in the tree so we know for sure that look this cannot be a valid tree edge so then what do i do this has to be a reject all right we need to reject this edge because it's to an internal node so i just reject no problem then let's say that if q is not equal to test node which means that as far as i am concerned i might have sent a test message to q and i would have said test node so just look at this i'm clearing off the ink so whenever i send a test message to some other node i set that node to the test node as the test node see if q is not the test node which means that i have not sent a message to q right saying that you know would you want to join me because the status of this edge was unexplored then clearly a reject message needs to be sent to q telling it that look we can't join because we are actually a part of the same fragment all right but if let's say a test uh, if let's say q is equal to test node which means that already a test message has been sent then i should call find min again and then move to some other node because clearly q is not the candidate and q will also mark this edge to me as a rejected edge because it would get my test message so so recall that when is a when is the test node set it is set when a test message is sent so the fact that q is a test node it basically means that a test message so which is this case so this is not equal to and this is equal to so in this case the fact that q is a test node basically means that a test message has been sent to q which means that over due course of time q will mark the edge to me as reject so i need not bother as far as we are concerned i know that q is a part of my fragment q knows that i am a part of his fragment we mutually know each other if it is this case if we mutually don't know that i should make q explicitly aware of the fact that look q you should not have sent me a test message in the first place because you and me are a part of the same fragment so we can never have a connecting edge between us hence i am rejecting this message so as i said regardless of how the message is sent either as a test message or as a reject q will ultimately get to know that it is a part of the same fragment as p which is myself and it will pretty much mark me as invalid so given the fact that q is now a rejected node right what i need to do is i need to again call find min and if i again call find min what would happen is that in this case the status of q will not be basic anymore the status of i mean the other q the uh, the q that we have been talking about in this slide again p and q is slightly confusing but the good thing about a video is that the same slide can be seen over and over again to get the basic idea so in this case since the status of q is equal to basic this thing doesn't hold any more because we just rejected it then some other node has to be picked out of this set so we'll have a new minimum again we do the same again we send a new test message to the new minimum if it happens to be in my fragment so which means that i am a part of this fragment i send a message to q if somehow q also happens to be a part of my fragment unbeknownst to me either it would have sent me a test message so with that i will get to know that q is actually a part of my fragment so i'll mark it as invalid or q will send me a reject message and then i'll mark it as invalid and again i'll come to this point where i will start testing with some other neighbor of mine 
that satisfies this criteria and if I don't find a neighbor, I will report this fact. Alright, so now let me clean off the ink over here. So the key point is that of course if this holds that Q was a higher level I weight, otherwise we are part of the same fragment then of course essentially what I do is I reject Q, right the branch is rejected. And I call find min again because I would like to explore some other neighbor of mine. No problem. Otherwise, if the name, otherwise, if the names are unequal, names are not the same. If the names are not the same. Then what I do is I send an accept message to Q because there is no reason why I should not. Alright. So, so there is absolutely no reason why I should not. And uh, the thing is that uh, number one, there is no issue with the less than or equality. And furthermore, it is the least weight edge between the two fragments. Okay. So after I receive an accept message from Q, which means that Q does not have an objection, I set, uh, so once let's say P gets an accept message from Q, which means that Q does not have an objection, then I set the test node to null and let's see if the weight of PQ is less than the best weight that I have seen, then I set the best weight to weight of PQ and I set my best node to Q and I report this fact. So what I report is that look I have found something and as, as far as I am concerned my best neighbor is Q and report mind you is not a message to another node it's just a function call right so it's just an internal function call it is not a message an internal function call will be able to see these internal variables. If I receive a re and also what do I do if I receive a reject from Q well then I change the status of the edge from basic to reject and I continue with other neighbors. So no problem. What is the idea? The state the idea is that look, my state is fine. So my job is to find neighbors. I start contacting my neighbors. In an ascending order, I first I look at only the basic edges, not branch or reject edges. And in an ascending order of weight, I start contacting them. Either they can just hang on to my message and not reply to me right so so that is one option that they have the other is that they can either accept or reject if they accept it i record this fact if they reject it i move on to some other neighbor of mine so if let's say this rejects i move on to another neighbor of mine so what does the report method do it's a, it's, it's a method okay it's not a message it's a method so what the report method does is that it number one it looks at this set so this is the set of all q so again i am p and the other node is q any other node is q so i look at all my neighbors such that the status of the neighbor is branch and it is not a parent so it means it's a child right so so both of these things together it means that the other node q is a child because it's a neighbor of mine and it's not a parent so it can only be a child and if rec is equal to this so basically this expression over here the cardinality of this set is essentially the number of children so if rec is equal to the number of children which basically means that similar if you go back to the leader election algorithm in that we had discussed leader election in trees where all the children send their value, values to their parent and then it kind of propagates up the tree. So this is basically saying that look if I have received a message from all my children and a test node is null. So when do I set the test node to null? When I receive an accept message or when I find that none of my neighbors fit the criteria which basically means that no outstanding test message is there. So just uh, let's just look at the test node thing. 
when i receive and accept i set it to null all right and and when else do i set it to null i set it to null when i run out of neighbors so then also i set it to null otherwise i don't set it to null if i have sent a test message and it is outstanding then it is non null so the fact that here i am saying that test node is equal to null which basically means i have finished my job of testing so what it means if you go back to the tree based leader election algorithm that was in the previous lecture of the slide set so we had said that every parent essentially finds its own minimum and also aggregates all the minima sent by its children once it is done once all of his children have sent a message which is precisely being captured by this complicated looking mathematical formula over here which just simply put means that all my children have responded to me and test node is null, equal to null which again in simple layman's terms means that i am done with my job so together the if statement means that my children are done with their job and i am done with my job i set the state to found and i report as an honest child to my parent that look i am sending you the report message this is the best weight edge that i found the best weight edge means as far as i am concerned for my subtree this is the least weight outgoing edge it's a valid least weight outgoing edge and furthermore the node on the other side agrees to connect with me so i have a upfront commitment from the other node that is not going to refuse so then how do i process the report message so when i get a report message from q so again i am p i am always p and i get a report message from q in this case q is my child so then similar to again the last a uh, slide of the leader election algorithm with trees we said that a parent is its own parent and own child so something similar to this is happening over here see if q is not the parent in the sense if i am not if my child is not my parent which of course holds for the root node if let's say omega here is less than the best weight that i have seen then the best weight is omega and the best node is q it means that as far as i am concerned the child that is sending me the best weight is the best node so i will record this fact and furthermore given that my child is sending me a message i will just set rec equal to rec plus 1 which means that one of my children has responded and then i will call the report function the report function is the same as this which given the fact that we have understood this i can clean off the ink right and uh, so the so this will basically see in this case we will check whether all my children have replied or not and given the fact that the rec variable i just incremented so i'm assuming the uh, all of these variables are global within the scope of a node so since i have just incremented this it is possible that the if condition becomes positive and i enter this if i don't then there is no problem i just come back and i just keep waiting so this part of the code basically means that every parent waits for all of its children to report their best edges that they are finding it computes the overall minimum reports that to its parent so this is as i said what would happen in any tree that every subtree will report its best again the parent will collect everything from its children which again is the root of its own subtree and it will just propagate that up 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 and up no problem until you reach the root what is the root so the root in this case is slightly complicated we will come to it so if so otherwise if q is equal to parent in the sense i am receiving a message from my parent which means my parent uh, is sending me the report message it's kind of strange but we'll see when that happens so then we will see so in this case q is equal to parent if the state is fine okay if my state is fine i am still finding then i wait 
if omega what my parent is reporting is greater than best weight which means that my best weight is actually the best okay then th then i change the rule otherwise if let's say omega is equal to best weight which means me and my parent both are reporting infinity this means that we have actually reached the end there are no eligible edges so then the mst condition has been met and it's all done and terminate so now the structure of the parent is quite important okay and uh, see so if you go back to the connect message so then the parent thing is quite important but i would like to discuss change root first before going to parent because they are connected so let us now discuss the last algorithm which is the change root method so here what happens is that we have found out in the entire fragment which node is connected to the least weight edge so this has been found out why and how well so basically every single node of the subtree broadcasted its best values to the root and finally the root computed the minimum operation over here as you can see and updated the best weight and best node the best node is of course one of its child nodes that has a path to the eventual best node which lies at the edge of its fragment right so every node just keeps a pointer to its child and just by passing these child pointers you ultimately reach the edge where you have the edge that is the least weight edge of this entire fragment so now when you decide to change your root which basically means that you you are basically rooted at this node that is at the edge so what this essentially means is that if we consider all the nodes within this tree regardless of how they were so this is of course similar to the riemann tree algorithm for mutual ex uh, exclusion which was there in our lecture set so there what happens is we do a change root the change root essentially means that every node updates its parent pointer to point to the new parent so every node over here updates its pointer along the path right such that so if let's say this was the old root so all the nodes pointed to this and the new and the old root over here points to the new root which is over here and this is of course the edge that is pointing to a different fragment if this is f1 this is f2 and clearly via these edges it is possible to reach this node from any node within the fragment because every node within the fragment in any case was pointing to the old root so what will happen is that it will now what we are doing is we are establishing a path from the old root to the new root just by flipping child parent pointers so what we are doing is we we start from the root we just see the status of its best node if it is a branch then what we do is we send change root to best node all right and uh, no problem and uh, so so we just keep on doing that ultimately what will happen is we will arrive over here then what will happen is that the status of the best along the core edge what we will do is we will set the status of the best node to branch in the sense at this point the status of the edge e from basic will turn into branch which basically means that now we acknowledge the fact that e is the least weight outgoing edge out of the fragment and furthermore we will send a connect message connect level to best node which means across the edge e to the other fragment so what would we do the summary is that in the entire fragment each of the nodes looked at each of its children that are outside the fragment on undecided edges started from the minimum went up the ascending chain if there were any rejects ultimately till the other side gave an acceptance that yes i am willing to join and then all of this information was sort of got coagulated all the way up to the root 
and after that point a decision was made what genuinely is the best then subsequently another decision was sent back of course the parent pointers are flipped and i'm not showing that uh, in the slide but then after that the parent pointers were flipped so so let's say that you know let's say this edge over here was found to be the minimum so then we set the status of this edge to be branch and then we send a connect message where the connect message will again take us back to algorithm 2 where what was happening in algorithm 2 what was happening is that we were processing the connect message and there of course if we found the lt condition we connected immediately so here uh, if you would recall we had kept something open so we had said if the lt condition is not holding so what could happen if this is not holding it means l is greater than equal to level right which is fine this means that from the outside a level is coming which is greater than equal to my level so now what i do is that i look at the status of the edge if the status of the edge is basic then i wait which means that so so what does this mean this means that i have not made any decision about this edge right so even if i have sent a test message on this edge i have technically not made a decision because i have not gotten any accept or reject and uh, so i have not made any decision hence i wait but let's see it is not basic then i come here and this is where we had left a question open what we had said is that what happens here so what happens here now we know so this basically means you reach over here number 1 if l is greater than equal to level number 2 if the status of the edge is either accept oh i'm sorry is either branch or reject okay so le let us look at the reject case first that is easier to eliminate if the status of this edge is reject then there is no reason why a connect message should have been again sent by the same edge because a connect message is contingent on the fact that an accept was received but since a reject has been received there is you know there is no chance that a connect message will be sent on the same edge because it means that both the nodes are a part of the same fragment so reject is not possible so this means that the status of the node has to be branch status of the edge has to be a branch which means that from the point of view of both fragments it is their least weight outgoing edge furthermore l cannot be greater than level this is not possible for a simple reason that for any connect to happen it should have gotten an accept first and if we actually look at it uh, if we just look at this line over here whenever a test message is sent in this case if l is greater than level then it just waits so then what would have happened is that in this case if l is greater than level then you know no prior communication would have been initiated in the sense an accept message would not have been sent this means that this branch would not have been chosen and definitely a connect message would not have been sent along this branch so even l greater than level will not happen so the only choice that we are left is that the status is a branch and furthermore l is equal to level nothing else is possible given that nothing else is possible what we see is that the eq rule holds in this case we were not able to see it the first time when we looked at this algorithm but now we can clearly see that the eq equality rule holds the status of the edge is a branch and furthermore the levels are equal right because nothing else is possible and that is how we initiate so what would happen is for two fragments at the same level if it let's say take a look at their joining edge so let's call these nodes p and p dash i don't want to use p and q anymore so what would have happened is that p would have sent a connect message to p dash and gotten an initiate back 
and PDA should have done exactly the same. Given that it's a branch for both, PDA should have sent a connect message to P and gotten an initiate back. Uh, in, and then what you see is in this thing that you send the parent, you set the parent to the other node. So you would have a parent relationship around this edge, which is also called the core edge that would look something like this. So this is why I said that as far as you know, all of these nodes are concerned, they will direct their parent pointers up here. But here you have the cyclicity around this core edge. So we can think of this edge as the parent and the two nodes here pointing to each other in a special kind of manner. And all the nodes within are pointing to basically the root and the root and the both the roots are connected to each other in this fashion. All right. So now what happens is that this becomes a bigger fragment. But let's say if this fragment now wants to join to another fragment, then what happens is that let us say that it finds a least weight outgoing edge. So the least weight outgoing edge can be over here. In this case, this cycle over here will break. All right. So this cycle over here will break. So this edge will go away. And what will instead remain if I want to draw it in a slightly bigger canvas. So what would essentially remain is something like this. If let's say these are the two fragments. Initially, what happened is if this is the core edge, this is how they were pointed towards each other. And if let's say this is the least weight outgoing edge, <clears throat> then this parent pointer will break down. All right. And then a sequence of parent pointers will be used to come here. So this basically means that now, as you can see, all the nodes in this fragment are pointing here as this is the new root. All the nodes of this fragment are also pointing here because they were pointing to the old root. So now they are pointing over here. Similarly, if this is joining with another fragment, depending upon the levels, uh, you know, the, depending upon what exactly is the level, you will have a connection that is made. All right. And uh, so, so let's say that this has a lower level than this. Then of course, this pointer is like this and you will have a core edge somewhere within this fragment. Otherwise, this edge over here will become the core edge and you will see such kind of a cyclic relationship. So this is kind of nice, interesting and elegant yet complex. So what we have basically done now is that we have looked at these special cases and we have furthermore said that what happens at the end. So what basically happens at the end is that we set the change root messages and finally a change root happens. And so gradually that's the way that your fragment actually expands, right? Your smaller fragments keep joining around core edges and they keep growing, growing, growing and growing. Ultimately, the entire graph becomes a single fragment. So now a little bit of an analysis. So we claim that there are order n log n fragment name or level changes total. We further claim that the message complexity is 2e plus 5n log n. e is the number of edges, n is the number of nodes. So what is the logic? Well, every node is rejected only once. Correct. Can't be rejected more times. One test message and one reject message. So every node that is not a part of the tree that is rejected only once and that's it finish. So that, so this is limited to two E messages. Fair enough. Where E is the number of edges. At every level, a node sends receives at most these many messages. How many messages? One initiate message. Right. So one initiate message to start. One accept message. One report message. Right. So, so, it, so it receives these two. So it receives an initiate message and an accept message. So initiate and accept is what it receives every node. And it sends a report message, a change route or connect message, depending upon where it is in the tree and a successful test message. So these are the five kinds of messages that it sends or receives. Furthermore, there is no intersection between the sending set and the receiving set. So we can say that for every level, these are the five messages that every node receives. 
So let's say if there are n nodes, then per level we have an exchange of 5n messages right here. Alright, so you can, you are welcome to verify this. So this is just a question of simple bookkeeping, that's all. Okay. And, uh, sorry, uh, so, so I have uh, just one more thing to add. So how many level changes will you have? Right. So what happens is that any time a level changes, any time that a level changes, we claim that the number of nodes, it at least doubles. So, so I would like to make a slightly tighter claim over here. So let's go over here. So the claim that I'm making is that any fragment with level L, okay, with let's say level L has at least two raised to power L nodes. So this is trivially true if L is equal to zero, it is trivially true. Because why? Because 2 to the power 0 is 1 and every node by itself has level 0. So this is trivially true. So now let us consider a mathematical induction based proof. So let us assume that till level L this holds. Right. So basically for all levels, for all L, or let's say 0 between 0 and L, this holds. So let us now consider level L plus 1. So how do you go to level L plus 1? You go to level L plus 1 only when two such fragments combine. All right. Otherwise, you remain at the same level and then only smaller fragments keep, keep uh, come and keep on joining you, which is fine. So, so then this induction hypothesis will still hold. So now if let's say two similar, two fragments of the same level are combining, then this will have 2 to the power L nodes. This will have 2 raised to the power L nodes. So total will have 2 raised to the power L plus 1 nodes, right? So, so that is a total. So again, as we can see in the bigger fragment whose level is L plus 1, the number of nodes that it has is again at least 2 raised to the power L plus 1. So the induction hypothesis does hold. So this means that the base case holds and the induction hypothesis holds. Hence by induction, every time we increase the level, the number of nodes at least double. All right. So this further means that with n nodes, the maximum number of levels that we are going to have is log n to the base two. So with the armed with this information, let's go back. So given the fact that we will at best have log n level changes, and per level change 5n messages are sent. So the total number of messages are 5n log n. So it is basically 2e plus 5n log n is the total number of messages that we are looking at. All right. So it is essentially two times the number of edges plus 5n log n. That's the number of nodes. So that's what we are looking at. So in terms of complexity, this is not that bad at all in the sense uh, we are able to take a very large distributed network and create an MST with n log n message complexity, which is quite good. All right. And in the space of distributed algorithms, of course, this algorithm is complex, but now of course, I hope that most of it is well understood. So now we'll discuss something called Shandy Lamport algorithm in one or two slides. It's called a distributed snapshot. So the idea is that fine, I created a large distributed algorithm. So what? So the idea is that in a large distributed system, if let's say we have a large number of processes, debugging this entire system is difficult because they are sending so many messages, right? So let's say even if we give students a homework to implement the MST, the minimum spanning tree algorithm. So so even then also, you know, debugging it is hard. So what we do is that every process takes a local snapshot of its state. So, so snapshot is basically, I want to capture a photograph of the entire system such that if anything is wrong with it, I can analyze the snapshot and find out what is wrong. But even taking a photograph of a distributed system where there is no clock synchrony is hard, right? So we are looking at one way of doing it. So, uh, 
So as I said, the algorithm is that every process takes a local snapshot. Furthermore, the process does not process any message. So of course, these are different processes. It doesn't act on any message while taking a snapshot. So what we want is we want a consistent snapshot in the entire distributed system such that we can act on it. So what this basically means is that if there is a sender and there is a receiver, and let's say the sender sends a message. It should never be the case that the receiver is taking a snapshot of its state where it is recording the message received. But in the sender's snapshot, the message send is not there. That should never be the case. Right? So if let's say the receive event is there, the send event should be there. That is the only requirement for consistency. There is no other requirement per se. All right. See if let's say that in a distributed system we were to take such kind of a snapshot, it would at least give us some kind of a photograph, which of course is not instantaneous, but might give us enough information to debug and find the source of a problem. So let's do that. So we'll use the Shandy Lamport algorithm, which is very simple. The only assumption it makes is that we have FIFO channels. FIFO is first in, first out channel in the sense A sends a message to B, the messages are not reordered. So the algorithm is like this, that we take a local snapshot, set taken to true for each of our neighbors, okay. We send a marker, okay, we send a marker to each of the neighbors. So then what does that happen when a marker is received? If taken is equal to false, if a snapshot has not been taken, then we take a, then the neighbor takes a local snapshot and it sets taken to true. Again, for each of its neighbors, for each of its neighbors, it sends the marker. So one thing that is clear is that let's see if I have a system like this. So let's say I take a snapshot, I send a marker to the, these three nodes. Each of these nodes then take a snapshot and then they send a marker, let's say the marker is sent here, here and here. But let's say this marker finds that actually this node has taken a snapshot, so the marker is ignored, right? So you take a snapshot only once when you get the marker for the first time. And after that, after the snapshot marker is done, you don't do anything and you just uh, record the state. And that's it. I, I mean, uh, either you can stop there or you can wait for another message to ask you to resume. So that's a separate matter. We'll, we'll get into that slightly later. So the theorem one is the algorithm terminates in finite time. Well, why not? Because you're sending messages. Ultimately, the message will reach everybody. And since every node takes a snapshot when it receives the first marker message, it will terminate. The most important is theorem two. That is, regardless of the distributed system, if I do this, what I'm saying is that the entire snapshot is consistent. What does the entire snapshot consist of? The entire snapshot consists of the individual snapshots of all the nodes, right? Whatever has been taken. That is what the entire snapshot consists of. And why do I say it is consistent? I claim that if a receive has been logged in the snapshot, its corresponding send has also been logged. That's my only requirement, no other requirement. So the theorem is that if a message from P to Q is sent after a local snapshot, then it is not a part of the receiver's snapshot. Fine, fair enough. So what I'm saying is that let's say that there is node P and there is Q. So let's say it takes a local snapshot and then it sends a message. So in this case, we don't stall after taking a snapshot, but we send a message. So then what I claim is that, so in this case, the send has not been logged, right? Because I take a snapshot first and then I send, so I, I didn't log the send. So what I claim is that at the end of the receiver, the receive will also not be logged. And the answer is very simple. The proof is very, very simple. The proof is that when I take a snapshot, I immediately send a marker message to Q, okay? After the marker message, I send my other message. This means that Q either gets the marker from me 
or from somebody else before me and takes a local snapshot. And only after that does it get the message M. By that time Q has taken its snapshot and it has not recorded the receive. Consequently, this is correct and consistent as per our definition. Given the fact that we didn't log a send, we didn't log the receive also. This was our simple definition of consistency. And as you can see, this simple algorithm does provide our definition of consistency. What is it? If a receive has been logged in the snapshot that is, that implies the send has also been logged. So what we were actually able to prove was the contrapositive of this, that if the send has not been logged, then the receive has also not been logged, which is what we were just able to prove over here. And this is the same as this. So anything contrapositive is basically A implies B is essentially the same as not B implies not A. Alright, so this is essentially proved by contrapositive. So this is what we have done. And uh, so we have one algorithm of at least recording a consistent snapshot in a distributed system. Why are we introducing this here? Well, the reason we are introducing this is for a simple reason that the MST algorithm was complicated, no doubt. Right? Given that the MST algorithm was complicated, when we actually code it on a system, on a distributed system, you will have many corner cases and the code is not going to work and then this entire PQ business is going to confuse you. Furthermore, what happens, so I'll just show you one of the slides which makes our life tough actually. So it is essentially slides like these. So for example this, so where we wait. The moment we have a wait, if the code is not written correctly, you might be waiting forever, right? It might be an infinite wait. And so the, these wait messages are essentially what kind of make us quite jittery. Alright, so, so th these are things that we don't like. See here the, also there is one more wait. So we don't like these things. So given the fact that we don't like these things, what will happen is that in most cases the code will not complete because the processes will just end up waiting because of some bug somewhere. So to debug such systems and find out what exactly has gone wrong, we can create a nice summary of all the actions that a given node has taken. We'll call it the snapshot of the node and use the Shandy Lamport algorithm to record a consistent snapshot, consistent as per our definition. And then the, this snapshot can be written to maybe the disk by all the processes. Then subsequently this can be analyzed either manually or via a script to find out what was the most likely cause of the error. That is the reason why this lecture combines a complicated algorithm with a very short and small and cute algorithm to effectively debug a distributed system because debugging a distributed system is hard. Now coming to the references, the book by Gerard Tell uh, has many of these details. And uh, so there are many other distributed algorithms as well in this book including a lot of concepts, so you are most welcome to read it and also implement the MST algorithm to get a practical feel.